Baseball, America's pastime. I know one thing is there's kids all across the world growing up on dirt fields and grass fields and cages, practicing in whatever community they're in. And for me, it was one of my greatest childhood memories. I remember as an only child going to school in the daytime and I couldn't wait to get out to this field behind me in the middle of Griffin, Georgia, City Park. I would come out here and practice really hard and uh, look forward to game days. And I would be so disappointed if we were ever rained out. Uh, um, I'll never forget that I actually found my identity in baseball almost to a fault. It was where people accepted me. It was where people knew my name. Um, and I began to carve out that road for my future. There's a rock right here in the center of this park. It's called Champions Rock. I'll never forget always wanting my name painted on Champions Rock. Unfortunately, that never happened. Um, Whoever won the City League Championship got their teams and their names painted on there, but it wasn't for me. Fast forward till I was in middle school and high school, began to continue this journey, baseball, so many memories. And for you, maybe you have memories of your childhood, memories of going to school, going to sports, hanging out with your family, going on vacation. I know memories that all of us likely share or are our childhood favorite movies. And so as we kick off this series at the movies, uh, we're going to explore some of the greatest movies, I think, of my lifetime and maybe even of all time. Today, grab your Bibles, and we're going to look at one of the greatest baseball movies, I believe, of my lifetime and maybe ever. It's a movie called Sandlot. Good morning, Relevant Church, and welcome to week one of At The Movies as we kick it off with a movie entitled Sandlot. How many of y'all remember Blockbuster Video when, when, when movie night was an adventure? Come on. I'll never forget, we'd leave our house around 6 o'clock p.m. and we'd go to dinner. We would call ahead to see if they had the movie. For some of you uh, students, some of you young people here today, listen to me. Uh, you don't know what it's like to have to go pick out a movie at a store. I'll never forget, we'd get a little card uh, and it, had, it, was, it was your card to check out movies. And you had to have this card and, uh, on, on the nights where you would be going to uh, the theater to, or going to the blockbuster to pick out a movie, you would call ahead to figure out, do they have the movie I want? And if they didn't, you would show up that day and uh, you would creep around the store hoping, uh, as you perused all the videos on the wall, you would, you would creep around the store hoping that someone, some lady, some man, some family would walk in and drop in all those videos that they had checked out throughout the whole week. And I'll never forget uh, being in the store as a kid, 8, 9, 10 years old, looking for movies, or even as I got older, 15 years old, 18 years old, in the store looking for movies, and it was nothing like when the person came. They didn't have your movie. Keep in mind, the movies actually weren't even in the case. You would have to take it to the front counter and get the movie put in the case and blah, blah, blah. It was a circus, but you, you look forward to movie night. You look forward to movie night with your family or whomever you're watching a movie with. And so you would go up to the front and somebody would drop in all the movies that they had checked out. And you would hear them just lady drops in 12 and poof, everything kind of falls in. And you would run up there. And I never forget running up to the counter and asking the lady, hey, can you check the drop box? And can you see if, if she dropped off the sixth sense? Come on. Y'all know that was the best movie ever made, The Sixth Sense. And so a lady would take and she would flip through uh, those movies. And if they had The Sixth Sense or they had the movie you were looking for, you remember how exciting that was. You just knew movie night was going to be incredible. But if they didn't, you would go creep around the store for another 10, 15 minutes hoping somebody else would drop your movie off. That's how we used to watch movies. See, now, uh, see, here's the thing. This new generation don't get it because movies can be streamed all over the world from these things called phones. See, we didn't have mobile phones back then. We didn't have the Internet. I know it's hard to believe. My grandparents used to tell me all the time, they would say, I used to walk, you know, both ways uphill in the snow with no shoes on to school. And, and it seemed like torture to us. But, but to this generation, you know what it's like to have streaming everywhere. But we didn't even have internet when I was growing up. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? No internet. And, and we didn't have mobile phones. Y'all know what a mobile phone was? See, the phone we had was on the wall. It was stuck to a wall. You had to dial it, and you had to stand right there. A mobile phone, if you wanted a mobile phone, what you had to do is go get you a long cord, and now all of a sudden you're mobile. You can go to the other room. I'll never forget when my grandmother got her first long cord, and I could go all the way to the other room to talk on the phone. Not so much today. And so as we unpack uh, this series, we're going to get a little bit of uh, fun and excitement uh, as we talk about movies, but we're doing movies from the 80s and 90s, some of the greatest classics. Any Karate Kid fans in the house? Come on. Yeah. Jurassic Park, Back to the Future, and then we're ending this series with a Disney weekend. Uh, we're going to be talking about Toy Story, and your kids are going to have a blast throughout this series. We got concessions in the lobby. We got all kinds of opportunities for you to just enjoy. I I'm curious if you're watching online, why don't you tell us which weekend you were looking most forward to? 
Today, we're kicking off Sandlot. And uh, what an incredible baseball movie. What an incredible baseball movie. Scotty Smalls, uh, one of the stars of Sandlot. He's a little kid. He's clumsy. He's isolated. He's alone in life. A little awkward. Come on. We've all felt this at some point. A little quirky. He's an outcast. He's rejected. But he wants to play baseball. America's greatest pastime or America's great pastime when it comes to sports. The problem is Scott, he didn't have the ability on his own to make the team. He didn't know how to catch. He didn't know how to throw. He didn't know anything about it. He just, he just wanted to be a part of something. And everybody doubts Scotty until Benny shows up on the scene. Take a look here and see what happens. Hey, online audience, uh, welcome today. I just wanted to come to you specifically and tell you what's happening in here so that you can kind of follow along in the notes and follow along with the conversation. Uh, we can't show these scenes online because of copyright laws, but here's what's happening. Scotty's now on the field with all the other players. He doesn't fit in. He can't catch. He can't throw. He looks out of place and everybody doubts him. And Benny, Benny the Jet Rodriguez, the star player, steps out from in the middle of a practice, stops what he's doing, and he comes out to teach Scotty how to throw. In fact, he says, have you ever had a paper out as a kid? Well, throw it like you're throwing a paper on somebody's front porch. And so as Benny goes to walk away, Scotty says, hey, Benny, but, but how do I catch it? And there's a pause. And just after that pause, Benny looks at Scotty and he says, I tell you what, you just hold your glove up and I'll do the rest. So Benny goes back to home plate and Benny hits a fly ball as you can hear it behind me now. And Scotty takes his glove and he sticks it up and he closes his eyes not knowing what to expect. And like magic, the ball falls into his glove and everybody cheers. They can't believe it. And then Scotty turns. After a pause, everybody gets their, their head on straight and he makes a perfect throw back to the infield. And immediately the team sees what Scotty's done and they've embraced him. And they talk about, wow. This guy has more potential. Let's play some baseball. What can we learn from this? Well, in about three seconds, we're going to talk about it. Well, what an incredible scene. In one moment, Scotty goes from being an outcast to being a part of a team, embraced by a brotherhood. Somebody who did not have a place on the field, was not a part of the family, was not a part of the team. Check out what Ephesians chapter 2 says. This is Paul the apostle writing to the church at Ephesus. And he's real specific about what it means to be a part of a, a family or be a, a part of a promise or a part of a group of people that matter and, and, and share the same beliefs. And he says this in verse 12 of chapter two. He says, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, in Jesus you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In one instance, in one moment in this movie, everything changed. Scotty went from being an outcast, lonely, isolated, to welcomed as a part of the team. Today I want to give you a couple thoughts specifically about the gospel and I'm going to take some truths from this movie Sandlot because here's the reality. We were all isolated at once. We were all rejected. We were all lonely. But there's something we can learn from this particular movie that I want us to take away, and that is this, that we can accept the fact that our salvation is in Christ alone. Let me say that again. In this particular life, we have no hope without Jesus. There's nothing we can do on our own to earn it. In this movie, Scotty doesn't deserve to make the team. Scotty doesn't deserve to be a part of the team. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to play baseball. Much like you and I in this life can't navigate this life on our own. And Scotty doesn't deserve to make the team. We don't deserve to be in God's family. But Benny steps in and he says this, hold your glove up and I'll do the rest. That's just symbolic, I think, in a lot of ways in our life of how Jesus stepped in and said, I know you can't do it on your own. I know you can't face this on your own. I know that you can't, you don't have the skills, you don't have the talent, you don't have the ability, you don't have the willpower or the self-control. And so Jesus steps in in our place. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Here's the thing. If you and I had the ability to do it on our own, why would we need Jesus? Scotty has no idea how to play baseball. But just through somebody stepping in and saying, hey, let me help you out. And then he literally says, hold your glove up and I'll do the rest. But you know what? How we view God matters, doesn't it? See, a lot of times we think, we think in our culture and we hear people say all the time is this, how could a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? We think that a lot. And, and if, we, if we take that train of thought, it'll, it'll upset the whole conversation about God if we're not careful. So let's flip the script. What if we ask ourselves a different question? What if we ask ourselves, we reverse the conversation and we ask that same question in a different way? Well, how could a bad God send his one and only son to give his life so that we no longer have to suffer the eternal consequences of our bad decisions? See, one question says, if God is good, then why this? The other question poses, well, God can't be bad because if he were bad, he never would have sent his own son. And when he sends his own son, Jesus, into this world, in one instance, God tells us that salvation is free through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, God says, I did it. I did it. I did it for you. I'm the one who embraces and accepts you. Just receive it. The problem is, oftentimes we struggle with this idea of approval. We might say, okay, salvation comes through Jesus alone, but man, all these people are watching me. If, if, how can God really accept me? What do I need to do to earn his approval or the approval of others? And so while we might accept the fact that salvation comes through Jesus alone, we don't let it permeate the, 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 every part of our being. And so there's a scene here that we're about to look at where the kids have lost all of their baseballs. They've hit them over the fence. And on the other side of the fence, you know, there's the great beast if you've watched this movie. This dog, this animal, who they are scared to death of this animal because they're fearful of their lives. If they go over the fence, this animal will, will kill them, chase them down, eat them, destroy them, whatever these kids are thinking in their minds. And Scotty, in an attempt to prove himself, to get validation from his team, he goes home and he grabs a baseball and he brings it back for the kids to play with. And as you would have guessed, there's the only baseball left. And as you would have guessed, the ball is hit over the fence and the beast gets it. Now what? What do we do? We'll take a look at the scene and we'll talk about it. So here we are in the second scene. Check it out. The ball that belonged to Scotty's dad was signed by none other Babe Ruth, the great Bambino. If you watch baseball, you know who great... The great Bambino is one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Scotty had no idea who Babe Ruth was. And the boys are flabbergasted at the fact that Scotty would do such a stupid thing and play backyard baseball with something so valuable. How stupid, how risky, how irresponsible. But oftentimes you and I do the same thing. Let's continue the conversation. The great Bambino, what an incredibly stupid thing. Why? Why would Scotty do such a thing? Why would he go home and grab a baseball from his dad's shelf or his dad's room? Why would he go grab something? It's because he wanted to prove something. It's because he wanted to be accepted. He wanted to be a part of the team. And what I've learned in my life is this, that we do some pretty irresponsible and risky things in order to be accepted by people. You know this when you were nine, the stupid things you did. When you were 12, the people you tried to impress. When you were 15 or when you got your first cell phone student and now all of a sudden, how many times do what our culture, it propagates us doing so many things to get double taps or likes or followers. We live in a culture that, that pushes us to do irresponsible and risky things to be accepted by people. But as Christ followers, there's something we have to do. We have to embrace our place in the family of God. You see, we accept the fact that our salvation comes through Jesus alone, but then we have to rest in this idea and embrace the fact that we have a place in the family of God, that we're not in this thing alone. And there's nothing you and I need to do to impress or prove anything to anybody else. Galatians chapter 4, another one of Paul's writings, Paul started churches all over the New Testament. One of those uh, 
places that he started a church was in the church at Galatia. And he says this, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship or to daughtership because you are his sons and you are his daughters. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, which literally means Daddy God. And so what this passage is telling us is that in our sin that Jesus came and gave his life to restore us back to God, but also to put us in a spiritual family. And that's good news for some of us because some of our families are pretty jacked up. The problem is because of childhood dysfunction, because of things that have happened to us, because of things that have, done, that, that have been done to us or things that we have done in our past that we haven't dealt with Many times we live our life seeking the approval of others. I will tell you this, though. There are responsibilities that we have in the family. But here's the thing. You're in the family. Yet being a part of a family requires something of you to participate in the life of the family. But rest in the fact. We'll get to that idea of doing, your, doing things to contribute to your family. But rest in the fact that you're in the family. If you're a follower of Jesus and you've said yes to Jesus and you've turned from your sin and you're doing your best to walk toward him, rest in the fact that you're a part of the family. Now, now that you're in the family, you have to play your position, don't you? You have to do your part. You have to play your position on the field. Serve in your local church. Give of your financial resources through tithes and offerings because you're a part of the family, not because you're looking for some sort of validation in the family. Keep that in mind. We don't do these things because we're seeking validation. We don't do these things because we're looking for some, um, somebody to approve of us or to earn our rights. We do it because we're contributing to our family that we're already in. So we accept the fact that our salvation is through Jesus alone. We embrace the fact that we have a place in the family of God. But what's next for Scotty, for Benny and the boys? Well, Benny, the hero of the story, he decides to attempt to get this autograph ball on Scotty's behalf. This ball is over the fence where the beast is. Take a look real quick at what happens next. So we are in our final scene that we're going to be showing today. And this is probably my favorite scene of the whole movie. If not, if not my favorite, it's definitely one of my favorite because the implications of this scene, um, it gets pretty intense here. Someone has to go get the ball for Scotty. Or Scotty's in big trouble. Let's be honest. Uh, some of us as children did some stupid things and our friends or our parents or somebody stepped in on our behalf. And so this ball is over the fence and the beast is on the other side of the fence. But, but who's going to step up? Well, Benny, of course, as you would have guessed, Benny the Jet decides that he's going to go and get this ball. In doing so, though, he runs a huge risk. He runs a huge risk. He's risking his life in his own mind. He's risking being eaten or tortured or, or attacked by this beast. And as he jumps over the fence, um, this dog, this animal that they have been so scared of, he jumps over the fence and he's running and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the fence collapses on top of this huge dog. The kids are shocked. They're stunned. The dog's not moving. What's next? Scotty's concerned about the dog though. Scotty's got a big heart and he sees Benny sitting over there and all the kids are standing around and Scotty goes over and tries to lift the fence off the dog. The problem is little Scotty's not strong enough again to do it on his own. And so then Benny walks up and after calling for his help, he and Scotty pick up the fence off the dog and the dog comes out from under the fence. He turns and he looks at Scotty right in the face and little Scotty Smalls is face to face with a beast, face to face with what's the fear that has been struck in these kids for so long. What's gonna happen next? And in one moment, the dog looks at him and licks him all over his face, slobber running everywhere. I don't know about you, you've seen a bulldog or you've seen... Those dogs were slobbers running over. He, he puts a slobbery kiss all over Benny's, or little Scotty's face. And then something really cool happens. The dog gets up and he walks over to this little area where he's been digging. And he takes the, the boys follow and they're looking. And the dog starts scratching. And underneath there, you begin to see baseballs emerge. All of the baseballs that they've had for the past months. They're ecstatic. They're overjoyed. And then the scene ends with this incredibly powerful line that we're about to unpack. One of the boys looks down and says, 
Whoa. Now we can play forever. In about three seconds, we're going to look at the implications of this together. Wow, what a scene. Probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. All that fear for so long. And that's what the beast does. I love it. I love that line at the end where, where he says, whoa, now we can play forever. I want you to write this down and we're going to unpack it for the remainder of our time together today. Here it is. Face your fears so you can overcome your past. Face your fears so you can overcome your past. So you accept the fact that you're Your salvation comes through Jesus alone. You embrace the fact that you're a part of the family of God. And then you have the courage to face your fears so you can overcome your past. Too many people walk into churches and they bury their past and they pretend because they don't feel like they're a part of a spiritual family. They feel like the person on the left is looking at them, the person behind them, the person looking at their life and saying, what's wrong with that person? Listen, when you accept the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation and he's all you need, when you embrace the fact that you have other people that are willing and wanting to walk alongside of you in the family of God. You're adopted as a son or a daughter of God. You don't have to bury your past. You don't have to run from your past. You don't have to have fear from your past. You you can't pretend that it didn't happen. You, You actually have to go after it. You have to face it so you can deal with it and live out your future. And too many people bury it. Pretend it didn't happen. You said before, I'll I'll never go back there. It's too scary. It's too painful. Pastor Carl, you don't understand how hard it is to think about my childhood. You don't understand how hard it is to deal with the dysfunction of my, my, my family. You don't know how hard it is that I've lost my child. You don't know how hard it is that somewhere along the way I went through a divorce or somebody hurt me or abused me. You don't know how hard it is. You are right. I don't know how hard it is. But listen to me. The key to unlocking freedom in your future is dealing with the dysfunction of your past. It always has been and it always will be. You can't sit back and expect something that you've buried not to have an effect on you. And so I want you to live forever with Jesus through your salvation and your trust and your faith in him. But I also want you to live in freedom from your past as long as you're here on this earth. And too many people are just surviving, not thriving never reaching their full potential because they've got something buried inside of them and it's causing this backlog in their mind or in their heart. And yes, it is scary. But my experience tells me something. My experience tells me it's a lot scarier in your head than the actual healing process can be. Because most of us have resolved the fact that we will never be whole. We'll never be able to overcome that. And so we've, we've just accepted it. And so now dealing with it seems like an insurmountable task. But I'm seeing people by the hundreds take steps through things called the good life. And we have a new one starting in the month of August that you can sign up for now at myrelevant.cc. It's the good life where we go and we deal and we understand that we are dysfunctional. We all have dysfunctional, but God is good and he has a plan and a purpose for our life. And people are coming out of the good life, coming into next steps, going through emotional health and spirituality, going to counseling, getting help, joining CR, getting help in whatever area of their life. And now I'm seeing people begin to flourish and begin to thrive and do things they never thought they could do because what they've done is face their past so they can live out their future. And so it's scary. It's not easy. It's hard. But it is simple. It's simple in the fact that you have to take a step today. You have to, first, you have to understand and accept the fact that your salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. Embrace the fact that you have a family of believers that wants to walk alongside of you. I've said it a hundred times. Salvation comes through Christ alone. Wholeness and healing come through the body of Christ. And then thirdly, with those two things as the foundation, now you can face your past so you can live out your your future. You know, I love, I love this movie because there's so many, I think, just inspiring moments. I can sit in front of a movie and I can get all emotional. I can get all worked up, see the story of somebody's life playing out. And we'll do that in the series and have a lot of fun. But the greatest story ever told, the greatest thing that we can ever see throughout history is not just some 
movie or some script or some writing. It's the fact that Jesus came into this world. He lived a sinless life. He is the Son of God. He took your sins upon his back. He took my sins upon his back so that we could not have to die for our own sins, but yet we could have them crucified on Jesus' back. He would be put in a tomb. He would be resurrected so that you and I could have new life and be a part of the family of God and then heal from our past. That's really, that's really the greatest story I can think of. And so today I want to know maybe there's somebody here and you'd say, Carl, I'm not a follower of Jesus. Today God wants to give you a new start. And so I want you to close your eyes all across this room. And in this moment, God transcends time and space. And I know he's speaking to some people right at this moment. And you say, Carl, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but today I want to make Jesus the center of my life. When I say three, I want you to lift your hands all across this room between you and God. This is you saying to God right now, that's me. That's me. I'm putting my trust and faith in you. Come on, one. Don't let a video or don't let an environment or don't let a time frame or don't let what's going on this afternoon keep you from doing it. Come on, two, lift your hand to Jesus. Three, I want to make Jesus the center of my life today. Now there may be others of you, you would say, Carl, I need to embrace the fact that I'm a part of this spiritual family. I'm going to do my part, but I'm also going to take a next step to find healing. I'm going to go to the good life. I'm going to get count. I, there's some steps that I need to take. Whatever they are, today you're, you're, you're saying before God, I'm ready to take those steps. Come on, all across this room, online, right where you're at. If that's you, let us know. Come on, one, two, three, raise them up. Come on, yeah. Let me pray for you. If you lifted your hand today and you said, I want to make Jesus the center of my life, I want you to, I want you to just, just pray these words underneath your voice right after me. Dear God, I come to you right now. I believe Jesus lived a sinless life, died on the cross for my sins, was put in a tomb, and was resurrected so that I could have new life. I pray you forgive me today. Be Lord of my life. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. Today I call you my Savior, and I call you my Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, God, I pray for every single person who lifted their hand that you would give them the courage to take the step, not just have a good intention, but to actually take the step and towards you today of obedience so that they can deal with the things from their past and live out the potential of their future. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.